Hi, my name is Adam Tendler. I'm a concert pianist, a writer, and I'm also the curator and director of the summer uh, music series at the Frank Sukumel Memorial Arts Center. It's my privilege and my honor to uh, serve in that capacity. Um, I'm just going to talk to you a little bit today. It's also the brightest it's ever been in the history of my studio. <laughs> I'm going to keep playing with the sunlight, but I'm going to give a little bit of an elevator speech today about one of my favorite pieces. And you might be surprised to hear that one of my favorite pieces is by John Cage, a composer who I specialize in, whose music I play a lot of, and it's his very famous 433. Now this is a piece that is sort of a lightning rod piece. People have been debating it, writing about it, arguing about it, uh, and frankly, characterizing or mischaracterizing Cage for decades uh, based around really that piece, which was written in 1952, and <clears throat> it's often called the silent piece. Um, but really what this piece is about is uh, performing for a certain duration of time uh, without making any intentional noise. And of course, that usually means you're still and not making sound. But it's not really about silence, and it's not really about hushing people and telling people what to do. It's about making unintentional sound. I'm not going to give a tremendous amount of background about this piece because there's a lot that you can read about it online. There's a really excellent book by Kyle Gann called No Such Thing as Silence, which talks about the context, uh, the history, the background of this particular piece. It's a really great book. There are also like multiple versions of the score that you can buy. There's a very simple one, which is just, uh, we call it the tacit score because the score inside in Cage's hand it describes sort of the history of the piece. The pencil markings are my own, but then it's just it says tacit, 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 three movements. The piece has always been done in three movements. Um, of course, not a fixed rule, but that's the performance practice, and Cage even has it in his tacit score that there are three movements. Um, but there's also a really terrific sort of anniversary edition of the piece, which has multiple versions of... The original score looked like actual like an actual score just there was no <laughs> there was no notes there there were no notes there uh, that's lost but it was recreated uh, there's the tacit score which I just showed you here it is again <clears throat> there's also a score that Cage made during his lifetime which was sort of graphic and you can see that it has you know lines and of course a lot of blank space I will tell you one thing that this piece wasn't sort of born in a vacuum and it wasn't just sort of a radical idea that Cage came up with one day to annoy people. And that's often what people think is that this is like a hostile piece to the listener. It's certainly what people at the premiere uh, in Woodstock, New York uh, in 1952 thought. Some people really were offended by it and people are offended by it to this day. I'll also tell you that I performed 433 in that space and it's an outdoor amphitheater. Uh, it's open air, and it's surrounded by trees. It's in the forest. And so even that gives you a little bit of context about this piece and where it was premiered. It wasn't actually premiered like in a conventional concert hall. It was premiered outside where you can actually probably hear more interesting sounds. And I know I'm all over the place, but the author of that work, of that book about 433, Kyle Gann, uh, the book again is No Such Thing as Silence, he once told me in conversation that he's never attended a performance of 433 where each movement didn't sound different from the other. And we're talking about weird ways to define a movement, like maybe in the first movement, we heard wind. Maybe in the second movement, a car honked and a plane went by. And maybe in the third movement, a child screamed outside. <laughs> you know. But he said there's way we start to think about sound differently when we experience 433. And so in this little brief moment with you, I'm going to make a case for the piece. I mean, whenever I do it, I perform it in three movements. The performance practice at a piano is that you raise and lower the lid to signify the movement breaks. Um, the premiere uh, performance in 1952 by the pianist David Tudor, a legendary concert pianist um, who specialized in contemporary music, the three movements were 30 seconds, 2 minutes and 23 seconds, that's the second movement, 
and one minute and 40 seconds for the third movement. <clears throat> you can notice that the middle movement is long, it's sort of, I call it the slow movement. Um, and Cage arrived at these durations and really arrived even at the piece based on stuff he was doing at the time with regard to compositional practice. He was building music using sort of like time frames and chance determined notes and rhythms and rests. And he came to the I sort of idea, and again, there's many theories as to how he came to the conclusion of uh, writing a piece that was only rests, only silence, um, as opposed to like notes and rhythms. And that's how he came up with 433. Again, there's also speculation about why it's that length. Um, at the time, Muzak was like everywhere, like on trains, in public spaces. <laughs> and the the time for a Muzak track was sort of like the time for a pop song today. It was like four minutes, four and a half minutes. And so some there's some speculation that Cage was even responding to that. But uh, I keep sort of stalling on exactly why I wanted to talk about this piece. It's why I like it. Um, I find that this piece not only teaches us to sort of, or it leads us in a kind of meditation practice sort of way to frame time, to frame our experience within the sort of framework of art or music. It, it encourages us to view our surroundings and view time and space and just the ambience around us as art. Now, again, that might be really provocative to many people, but I actually find that it can be really electrifying. It can be a really electrifying experience um, to do that, to practice that. Um, of course, I know many people who meditate, and it's not like they meditate and they just go into some sort of, you know, trance. Of course, they're restless. Of course, they have thoughts coming up. And the experience of 433 as a listener and as a performer oftentimes is a very restless, very nerve-wracking <laughs> experience. Um, but I find that it's really exciting and really electrifying. Um, I also, I find that when the piece doesn't work and when I've attended per performances of it or when I've actually led performances of it is when people sort of get in the way of it. Um, and that's gonna kind of lead me to my final point about why I even like teaching this piece to students, concert pianists, any kind of instrumentalist, and I have. Um, but when people sort of, they can have a tendency to make this piece about themselves. And what I mean is like, if I'm a performer, I might do some sort of silly gesture or somehow act like the piece is a joke or that my performance of it is a joke. And what that does is it inserts me into the situation and makes the piece, which is about nothing, about me <laughs> and about how funny I am or how funny it is. And I find that it disrupts the whole situation. Audience members can do that too. They'll sit there with a timer and they'll time it. Um, they'll come to me after. That wasn't four and a half minutes. Of course it's not. There's movements and there's time between those movements. So it's actually almost never 4.33. Um, but I find that even when people do that, it's a way to avoid presence. And a lot of Cage's music, whether it's 4.33 or just any of his other pieces, and some of his music is very tonal, very consonant, really gorgeous, um, some of it's more experimental, um, and some of it is more challenging, but, um, I find that, uh, it's not funny and it's not about, uh, making people sort of upset or whatever. And so when people, uh, and it's always, I think, encouraging a state of presence, that can be really scary for a lot of people. I guess that's what I was just trying to say is when, and there's many ways to avoid presence and to reject presence. One of those is to like time the piece or like scoot your chair so that you're making sound or laugh or do sort of all of that, just like how I could draw attention to myself performing the piece. All of that is a way for an audience member to draw attention to themselves. Then the piece is about them. <laughs> so that idea about presence, I think, is something that's really important for musicians uh, audience members, just people who are in the realm of music to uh, explore. And so when I teach this piece, and I've taught it to kids, adults, and, and I find that one of the things that's so exciting about it is that, you know, if we're performing a piece by Beethoven or Chopin or whoever, uh, yes, we perform the work, but in the performance, we, as a, as a performer, we have a state of presence and we are captivating the audience in some sort of way. Um, through our presence, 
What 433 does, which I find really interesting, is it strips away all the details. There's no notes, there's no rhythms, <laughs> there's no music in the conventional sense, and yet it requires the performer to be riveting without, to my last point, making it about themselves, which I find to be a very difficult paradox. How can I be captivating? How can I um, compel my listener, my, my audience, to want to watch this, to, to be riveted by this performance, um, how can I have presence without doing anything? It's the hardest thing to teach. I don't even know if it's teachable. Some people, we might argue, have presence, others maybe don't. But to sit at an instrument or sit holding a violin or to, I, you know, just to be and somehow capture attention, this is a very hard skill for any performer to do. And 433 is a master class in that. Uh, the last thing I'll say about it uh, is that, you know, Cage never had a narrative for this piece. There's very few pieces for which there is a narrative in Cage's, you know, oeuvre. But uh, I find that it can be really refreshing. And of course, Cage later said it doesn't have to be certain durations. You can do this piece as long as you want and here, wherever you want. I find that that's a really exciting invitation. Cage sort of invites us to have, if you will, a moment of silence um, and a moment of stillness, a moment of non-intention in a world where there's a lot of noise um, and <laughs> not a lot of stillness uh, and there's intention everywhere. Cage encourages in this piece to, just like he's saying, to frame time a certain way, to also carve out time and you can perform this piece anywhere. You can be at an instrument, you can be in a field, and somehow carving out that time for yourself, or for somebody else, uh, it's, it's a really soul-nourishing experience, um, and I encourage you to do it. I should do it a lot more than I do. <laughs> um, I probably will today, now that I've talked about it. But I wanted to carve out this space to talk about 433, to sort of disrupt the narrative that this piece is somehow a joke or somehow a hostile uh, act uh, from Cage, from a performer. Um, it's so much more than that. And uh, like the piece itself, it's sort of what you make it. Um, I encourage you to explore more about John Cage and more about 433. Um, and I find that you'll be surprised and delighted and excited. And maybe I'll do it this season at the Frank Sukumel Memorial Arts Center. <laughs> now I want to. Uh, have a great day. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you this season.